We are finished. We begin the, the service proper. I will invite you to stand and I will go down to the entrance to the church to receive Jean's body. You'll notice in the church today a lot of baptismal signs. When we are baptized, we, are, we allow ourselves to be immersed in life through in and with Jesus Christ, who is God with us in human form. And it is that union with Jesus Christ that makes us participate, even now in the resurrection, life that death must mark but cannot imprison or destroy. And that is why when a baptized person dies, there are these baptismal reminders. So the main one is this Easter candle, which the church uses, those of you who come from churches that are um, that have this church called tradition from the very early church, it's it's prepared and blessed on Easter Saturday night coming out of the darkness of the crack. It's a sign of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, risen from the dead, and conquering all darkness and all death. And during the Easter cycle, that particular year it stays here next to the pulpit. And then after the Easter cycle it goes to where the baptisms are normally put in that church. And a person who has been baptized dies. The Easter candle is called the Paschal candle, is brought near the casket as it is today in the case of Jesus. So that's the main sign. The other two signs you will um, experience when I greet the body at the entrance to the church. The first one is water, basic sign of baptism. So Jean's body will be blessed with the baptismal water. And then the pall, the only thing on the casket is going to be a white garment. You have the scripture references here, you can check them out at some other time. So that bouquet that's on it now has to come off, and it has to be placed over here until it passes the casket and leave the church. So we can have a reference to the book that bouquet. Once we finish the entrance right, uh, I will escort the body up during the entrance here. With the entrance, we will invite Gabriel and Travis to come and they will stand next to me and we are going to place on Jesus' casket two Christian symbols, the Bible and a cross. So a sharp form of the high state and then I invite the one with the Bible first to place it and open it and place it on the casket and then short form of the cross is placed. Then we turn our attention to the Eastern Temple. And uh, in your program, you see what's called the ceremony of the Easter candle. And this is an antiphonal um, part of the ritual between you and me. This is when the people back and forth, except at the end, when we, when we say the words together. What that is, is a proclamation, it's a public declaration of our Christian belief in Jesus Christ's resurrection. We see the biblical references there. They're all biblical references. And then I do opening prayer. After the opening prayer, we have the liturgy of the word. Um, Jim Walsh will do the first reading from the book of Job. After the first reading, we remain seated for the responsorial psalm. It's a reflection on the human and Christian understanding of death, physical death. And particularly as we have experienced it in Genoa. And then there is an offering that the family um, has actually taken up in the of getting a new keyboard, in a new keyboard for the church because the board has been for it recently. But you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> then after that, please, and it's just going to be a walk of collection for the simple reason that one of COVID, you know, passing things around. So, the basket is over here next to the Easter candle, so you just walk up socially distance and put in your contribution. Then we have what's called the final commendation and farewell. This is like the last hug and kiss that we give Jean as we surrender her body now into God's hands to the heart of life. And this is a very simple um, rite 
they will need to do the entire to, to uh, pray silently and we have company in the fullness of life. And then the central sign of the right of commendation is the right of insensation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, incense is a fragrant compound that's made up of various recipes. And in ancient cultures, Incense was used in civil ceremonies to honor, to have a proper respect for civil officials. So an emperor, for instance, or a lord would be in a civic setting and there would be a huge cauldron with coals on it and they would put incense on it and the, the fragrance and the smoke would indicate, would be a sign of respect for the civil officials. In domestic settings, in some ancient cultures, it got it off on it, and you would use it for your guests. You would you burn incense as a sign of respect for your guests. Among the Jewish people in the Old Testament, and again, I have the references there in the text of the, the, the program for you. Um, God instructed the Jewish people to have a special recipe for the incense to be burned in the temple. It wasn't, to, they couldn't just get incense that was made for any other purpose and use it, but it is special as a and burnt in the temple as a sign of respect for God's presence in that it's very uh, special place, the temple of God, a sign of God's intense presence with his people. That's where the early Christians get it from. So you see New Testament references. Again, you have some examples in the text of your program. It deserves respect. And that's all the church is saying in that. But it will be a very quick, it won't take very long. But I'm saying it now, so I don't have to explain it then. You'll get the point when you see it happen. And one of the My sister, my sister would want all of us to praise the Lord. She was a woman of prayer. And she sang on the choir. Remember that? Yeah. Okay, so let's go. When like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like
We're looking for some funeral home. The funeral directors in Jamaica, they must always be within eye contact in case anything happens. They seem to just think they can please close the casket and remove the bouquet. You can put the bouquet up here, or you can leave it there too. You can put it up here. We're going to have the tributes now. I understand that um, our church here wants to do a tribute. Um, you have it? Um, so Hazel so will we'll do that, and then we'll go down in order as here Lisa, and then Gary, and Kevin. She was also predeceased by her mother. Her children would attend the church. So many memories were made right here in this church. You'd make sure we attend Mass every Sunday we were here. And here in Jerusalem, let us go to God's house. We will not to sit with the and the Let us go to God's house. mercy upon Jean and Granville. You bless them in their companionship and in their joys and sorrows you bound them together. Lead them together now into eternal peace and bring them together to the table where the saints feast in your heavenly home. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Please be seated for the liturgy of the word. Angel. 
soldiers is given a command to guard you in all of your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Alle, 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 alle. Alleluia, alle, 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 alle. Alleluia, alle, alle, alle. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. May the words of the Gospel be in our minds and on our lips and in our hearts. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God still and trust in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house. If there were not, I should have told you. I am going now to prepare a place for you. And after I have gone and prepared you a place, I shall return to take you with me, so that where I am, you may be too. What then matters? If we use that word, that insight of St. Paul as a clue into reflecting what I mean by that is we are born into the world as infants and we have to give that up. You have to die to infancy and you become a little bigger. You have to learn to stand on your own two feet. Sometimes it can be very traumatic. The infant wants to stay in mommy's arms forever. It can't work. You have to stand on your own two feet. Then another child comes and you're not the only child. That can be traumatic sometimes because you want to be the focus of attention. You have to give it up. Then you get a little bit older and you are told, you have, and properly so, you have to take on responsibilities. You have to learn to do things around the house. And sometimes that can cause trauma because you want to do as you please. Then you get a little bit older and you want to go to your friends and you know, you're told, well, yes, but before you do that, you have to do this and that and the other. And then as parents, you know, this is where they get the famous exchanges. Like, why me have you? I'm my family, I'm my mother, my father, and all of that. And why you don't love me? The famous one. Um, it's, a, it's a difficulty in giving up what you have, where you reach, and going out into a new stage that's unknown. Then you become an adult, you have your own life, you're doing very well. You meet somebody, you fall in love, you have to make a decision to get married, or if you're in another setting, say you, you, you feel the call to priesthood or something, you have to make a life decision. I want to give my life to this relationship. Suppose it doesn't work. Sometimes these things don't work. We have examples all around us. It can be nerve wracking, and yet life is, is saying to you, you can't stop, you have to make a decision, you have to keep moving. You can't hold on simply to what you have and where you reach. And then you, you become a middle-aged person if God gives you that grace. And then you begin to see signs now of aging. Gray hairs, wrinkles, pains in parts of your body you didn't know you had. 
And many of us, when we get to that stage, we're like a huge aircraft coming in for a landing. You want to reverse the engine and pretend this is not happening. It's because we want to pretend that we're not being moved away from where we are, what we're comfortable with, into the unknown. And it's, some people don't make that transition very well. And then comes the moment when it's not just a stage of life that you're leaving, but you're leaving everything and everybody you've ever known in this world, which is the stage Jean has reached, Granville has reached, her parents, my parents have reached, my brother reached in January. Many people you and I know have reached when you're leaving not just the stage of life in this world, but the whole really deep unknown or whatever is out there. This is the experience of physical death for each of us. And it's led by our bodies, and it's an unstoppable dynamic. You can't stop it. You can try and slow it down, but that really doesn't work. And as you see the signs in the body, one way of, uh, of uh, trying to come to grips with this is to use this example about us and our body. Your body is like a dance partner. From the moment of conception, you and this body are one unit. And you come out of the womb and you're in the world, you are this body. And the body is always giving you signals and you're receiving signals and sending signals to the body. And the body is receiving your signals. Together you constitute one dance, the dance of your life. As you see the body age and go into death, the body is summarizing all the signals that the body has ever given you in life. And what is that summary signal? The body is saying to you, and just look at it. Whether you bury the body or you cremate the body, the body isn't going out into nothing. It's going out into everything. Everything that constitutes the world and the universe and whatever constitutes reality. The body is going out into it. And that's your dance partner signaling, okay. That means I, your dance partner, I have to figure out a way of thinking and living and relating that cares about everything and everybody. Because that's where the, I'm being led physically into everything and everybody. If you don't reach that point in your life, as you're dying and the body is signaling to you, you die badly. You're trying to hold on to where you reach and what you have and who you have, and it can't work. And it's almost as if you are being pried loose and people like that die badly. On the other hand, what the body partner expects is that you, the human partner, that you, you, you're sensitive to the fact that you're, you are a self, very important, but you're a self that's supposed to care about everything and everybody. That you're to love, in other words, to the best of your ability. And therefore, as the body then leads you into everything, you go. And that person lives, a, dies a death that is really wholesome. They don't fall apart, they don't collapse. They don't disintegrate in the face of death. They keep it together. It's overwhelming, and you see them being overwhelmed, but you don't see them falling apart. Because they've, they've got the signal, they've understood it, and they have learned to be a good dance partner of their bodies, a good, they dance a good dance of life into death. Now, another way of looking at this is as the as you have to move through all the stages of life towards the final stage, which is leaving everything and everybody in this world and going out into the really deep unknown. Why does that happen to us? And why, look at it from a religious or Christian point of view, why does God allow that? God allows it because it forces us to face a question. The question can be put in different ways. But the question comes, and it comes to all of us in one form or another, at one time or another. It comes usually in small doses, and then it intensifies, but it comes. The question might be put this way. Since I have to leave, since I obviously have to leave, and the word obviously means the older you get, the more obvious it's going to become. Since I obviously have to leave, not just a stage in life, but the whole thing, everything and everybody I've ever known in this world and go out into the really deep unknown. What then, if anything, 
matters to me so much that I am going to keep trying to do it. I'm going to keep trying to become it. I'm going to keep trying to put it into practice. I'm going to keep trying to be that way to the best of my ability. Because that's just who I am. So even if I'm dead, I just need that. <laughs> Life will ring, W-R-I-N-G, out of each of us, our response to that question. It's a very simple way of putting this question. When all are you, who am I really? Not who I think I am or who I want people to think I am. Who are you really? This is why we have to die physically. Everything has to be stripped away until we reach the point where this cannot strip because of me this. And that dynamic is unstoppable in each of us. It's a beautiful thing in the sense that if you see people becoming, and I'll come to Jean in a moment, you stood up here and you pay tribute to her. Wonderful. Beautiful tribute. Some human way of understanding that can be there for us to help us make sense of it. Keep going. Keep going. Don't run. I know you want to run, but don't. This is where human religiousness comes in as, it, as fundamental. The human experience as a, as a confrontation with reality is what human religiousness is essentially about. Human religiousness can get turned into all kinds of different things, good, bad, and ugly, but essentially, human beings cannot get out of the fact that we are immersed in reality, or reality makes demands on us and we have to respond to, to, the, to the demands. If you strip that away to its fundamental um, level, you get the, the lesson of human religiousness, which is what? If you're going to face life as it moves you forward, away from where you are, into what you must face, what you must become, the, the best way of doing it is some form of the golden rule. Do unto others you have them do unto you. In other words, don't be self-centered. Feel for people. You're not, the, you're not the only person in the world. If you do that, then you go through these experiences, the, 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 the human tradition tells us, in a way that makes sense. So you live well and you die well. Inside of that experience, we have something more from the Jewish people, the Old Testament people. The Old Testament people say, the reason that life is moving us in this way, moving us to empathy, to the, some form of the golden rule, is because the God of life is in it. And the God of life is saying, come on, you should live this way, care for people. They tell us, this is the whole witness of the Old Testament, that that God stepped into their lives. Why their lives? Because they were an example of a people who were disregarded. Even with human beings learning empathy, you still had a problem with some people not mattering. They're poor or the enemy, they're to be wiped out. And according to the Old Testament, to fertilize possibility open up possibility. And when God comes personally in Jesus Christ, that's his one message. I am here for one thing alone. I am with you and I am not leaving you. And because I am immersed, when you give me a hard time, I'm going to suffer. Now, that is the way God is. People who understand that, understand that whatever they go through, good, bad, or ugly, this God who is bigger than everything we can go through, is in it with us. And if you live that way, like Jean Laban, it does something to you. You've talked a lot about Jean Laban's caring and loving. A caring person, individually. Her love for Granville, the love of her family, her professionalism. Her, uh, her civic attitude, caring, 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 loving, loving, loving. And then at the same time you say, but church meant a lot to her. Those two things are connected. Because what she sensed was, I have to decide who I am in life. Life is saying to me, Jean Laban, who are you really? Who are you really? And her conclusion is, I am a woman who loves. I'm a woman who cares. 
I care for my husband, I care for my family, I care for my community, I care for the people I, I work with and for, I care. It's a decision. Why does she come to that decision? Because she comes to a point where if she, if she wasn't that way, she wouldn't be Jean Lavan. It's her I am. I am this way, I am that way, I am Jean Lavan. It is her participation in God who, when Moses says, what's your name? He says, I am. Jean Lavan found that God. And that was why she should come to church and she would go through the ch things in church. But church is full of people who are not perfect. Why do these people come to people like Jean Lavan? Talk about choir, talk about this, talk about that. That's not the main thing. She's, she's, first of all, she's making a statement. Perturing her. It's fertilizing her life. It's encouraging and strengthening her. It gives her a vocabulary. When things are happening, she, she, she has words to describe it. And she pulls it together and it helps her keep herself together. And as everything then gets stripped away, Children leave, grandmother dies, she becomes more isolated, she can't come out. She's reduced in a sense back to Jean and whatever is out there. But by this time now, it's a richer experience. She has become aware of what's out there. And she and what's out there, she and God, become tight. And that's why you notice as she goes into death, as a human being, it's, it's scary. But, but the scariness that the woman decide, uh, disciples in the gospel is fear and trembling, but they go. She is scary, but she goes. And the, 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 the fear and trembling are overcome. And you notice her life hangs together, it doesn't fall apart. There are people who collapse, their life is pulled apart in the face of death. Death is a shattering experience for the person dying and for those around. It's shattering enough for you who are participating in it from outside. How do you keep it together when you're the one dying? And she does it. But she does it because of this whole story that I'm alluding to. And it feeds into her like 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 water irrigating a life and it becomes fertile with possibility and what you have as i said in my introductory remarks are two things coming together a very limited human being and a limitless god in that body it's a resurrection it's a transformation a transubstantiation of human reality a very ordinary human person so you look around and say, well, what is it about this woman? A woman, she lived in the same place, in conditions. Why is she different? Because of what came together in her, with her agreement. And this is, this is something you recognize with faith, but this is something you actually experience in your life. The quality of humanity in this woman is the fruit. You may wonder at it. What I'm offering you is the reason behind it. And it's a reason available to all of us. Maria.
Please stand for the final commendation and farewell. Trusting in God, we have prayed together for Jean, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Jean and Brandon again and enjoy their friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of God's kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus.